Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Ring, a Japanese film released in 1998, sometimes called Ringu. Ring is based on Koji Suzuki's 1991 novel of the same name. It follows a journalist's investigation into a cursed videotape, which is said to kill anyone who watches it after seven days. Like the novel, the film plays out much like a procedural, with the characters following clues and uncovering facts about the tape's tragic history. At the time of Ring's release in Japan, American horror was dominated by scream inspired teen targeted slashers. Ring and its 2002 American remake by Gore Verbinski popularized remakes of J horror and other Asian imports. These supernatural, often PG 13 films, briefly dominated early aughts horror until they were superseded by torture porn thanks to Saw and Hostel. Regardless of how brief the Asian horror remake boom was, it's hard to overstate the importance of Ring. It's been referenced and parodied to high heaven in everything from scary movie to family guy. This thing has got sequels, prequels, 3D sequels with their own 3D sequels, TV shows, mangas, multiple remakes in multiple countries, <gasps> video games, visual novels, Dead by Daylight DLC, a grudge crossover movie, and even some first pitches at baseball games. Yeah, I'm tired now too. Even non-horror fans are probably familiar with Sadako, Ring's long-haired Japanese ghost girl, or at least Samara, her American remake counterpart. There's no way I can cover the entire mega franchise here on the Kill Count, so for now, we're just going to look at the classic original. How many viewers will this violent VHS take? No, no, take this thing away from me. Soren, what the hell are you doing, man? Well, I was just working on They Talk Season 2 when suddenly... My wallet! It's just all these subscriptions that I've lost track of. They're just taking all of the money I'm trying to save. Oh, well, don't worry about that, buddy. We can fix that with today's sponsor, Rocket Money. See, Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower bills, and manage money all from your phone. Check this out. Whoa! Yeah, pretty cool, huh? You see, with this app, you can set custom budgets for your spending, which I find incredibly helpful. You can get notifications when you exceed your limits, and you can feel comfortable treating yourself when you know you have the room in the budget for it. <laughs> it would be nice to not overspend on Fortnite skins. <laughs> Again. I hope you got Becky Lynch at least. I did. Okay, good. And you can keep track of all your recurring fees, making it easy to see and cancel any unwanted subscriptions. Wow, this is amazing! You know what? Thank you so much, James. No problem, man. Quick question, though. Where, where's my laptop? Um, I don't know. It'll, it'll turn up, probably. What do you mean, probably? You can take control of your finances today by going to rocketmoney.com slash kill count to get started for free. How many viewers will this violent VHS tape leave deader than physical media? Oh, let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with an oceanic title card. Get it? Title? Like, like the tides? It's a staticky September 5th, and high schoolers Tomoko and Masami are having a sleepover. They're playing the usual games, like guessing which one of them will be played by Pam Anderson in Scary Movie 3, and determining their favorite BNL song of the day. Tomoko mentions an urban legend about a cursed videotape, and reveals she saw the tape with some of her friends on a recent cabin trip. She laughs it off, but don't tee he tossle too hard, ladies, because the phones are ringing, just like they say happens a week after you watch the tape. Tomoko ends up downstairs by herself, where she senses an off-screen presence, which kills her by sending her into a static shock. The curse has become so well-known that it's being investigated by journalist Reiko Asakawa. She's been trying to track down the origins of this urban legend for her latest story. Ah, Reiko's got a precocious son named Yoishi. He's mature enough to set her clothes out and zip her up, and his interests include dinosaurs and Danny Gonzalez? Yo, that kid's cool! Even if he does wear his socks high. Those are halfway to stockings, my dude! Mother and son head to Tomoko's funeral, since turns out Reiko was Tomoko's aunt. Yoishi was close to his cousin and struggles to understand her death. Tomo-chan, Reiko's sister, Tomoko's mom, has an even tougher time since she found her daughter's body looking like she'd seen a ghost. Tomoko! Reiko learns that Tomoko's cabin vacation buddies have also all recently died. One of the friends, Iwata, died completely off screen, and since we never met him, I can't put him on the count. But Reiko tracks down a video of two of the others, and since it shows Tadahiko and Yoko's bodies, they're eligible. Just as with Tomoko, Toko was left looking, uh, not good. 
こんな死に顔初めて見たよ。Never seen a kid corpse look that scared before! And freaky faces aren't the only thing wrong with these kid cadavers! 死因はわからない。突然の心臓停止ってことしか。Reiko pokes around and finds a receipt for an Adobe subscription? Oh, no, this is from a photo development place since Tomoko had been taking pictures on her cabin trip. Reiko picks the pics up and discovers a group shot that's been marred by ghost exposure. Ooh! She also learns the cabin was an Izu, a peninsula off the coast of Honshu, Japan. This isn't the first time she's heard about Izu in relation to the tape. Reiko heads to Izu and tracks down the cabin the teens were staying in. Ah, B4 must stand for Blurry 4. She goes to the campground office where they have a videotape shelf. Amidst the diehards and Indiana Joneses, she spots a suspiciously unmarked tape. Like any good horror protagonist, Reiko immediately watches the cursed death tape. It's plenty creepy, and also would probably get a passing grade in an experimental film class. There's garbled text, a hairbrush and mirror lady, some shots of. Whatever's happening here? Um, it's pretty cerebral. <laughs> you might not get it. <laughs> the video ends on a shot of an empty well before the tape cuts to static. An unsettled Reiko sees a ghostly reflection before receiving a haunted house call, confirming the legend's veracity. I was surprised to see that, unlike in the American version, the characters never hear a voice on the other end of the phone. Instead, Reiko is left talking to herself. <laughs> That's, that, that's chaos. Ring's impact on horror is even more impressive considering director Hideo Nakata never meant to work in the genre. His feature film, the 1996 ghost film Don't Look Up, was a low budget fundraising effort to finish a documentary. Before he could do that, he was approached by the producers of Ring, and the rest is history. And so, you know, actually, the genre of horror uh, to me is. Uh, On his old enough trek to school, Yoishi runs into his estranged father, Ryuji. It's September 14th, the first day of Reiko's seven day death sentence, and Ryuji is here to lend his assistance. Ryuji is a university professor, which you can tell by his messenger bag. He's also a psychic, which you can tell by his face whenever he enters a room. Ryuji is played by Hiroyuki Sanada, last seen on the kill count as freaking Scorpion in 2021's Mortal Kombat. You might recognize him from other stuff, though. I mean, the guy's kicked a lot of ass in a lot of movies. This isn't the first time he's played opposite Reiko's actress, Nanako Matsushima. The two played lovers the previous year in the J drama Kanakoi no Hanashi, or A Story of Love. Ryuji is skeptical about the tape's powers, but Reiko snaps a Polaroid that leaves her looking like a page out of the Mandela catalog. Naturally, Ryuji also watches the cursed tape. Y'all really gotta stop watching that tape! Ryuji doesn't get the follow up phone call though, so he has Reiko make him a copy of the tape. Hope it doesn't have copy guard on it! Remember that? It was like that anti piracy distortion when you tried to copy a VHS. It was all like red and dark. No? I'm just old? Okay, that's cool. On day two, Reiko investigates the tape's origins, while Ryuji investigates her parenting. <laughs> Reiko and Ryuji's marital strife was an invention by Ring screenwriter Hiroshi Takahashi. In the novel, Ryuji is an old high school friend of male protagonist Kazuyuki Asakawa. Other differences, including updating the protagonist's profession from a newspaper reporter to a TV journalist, and giving Reiko a son instead of a daughter. A more book accurate TV movie adaptation, Ring Kazanban, actually came out three years earlier, but it was much lower budget and much, much hornier, depicting Sadako as a naked ghost lady. While going through the tape frame by frame, Ryuji notices a figure referred to by fans as the Towel Man. Slowing down the audio allows Ryuji to make out some speech, and the guy ain't telling them not to forget their towels. <laughs> Owl Man spit in fantasy verses. Ryuji finds out the witchy verse originates from Oshima, a volcanic island near Izu. Reiko wants to go investigate, but Ryuji wants her to spend time with her son before it's too late. She takes his advice and spends her fourth day fishing with Yoichi and her father. They don't catch any fish, but they catch a hell of a problem when Reiko wakes up to find Yoichi watching the tape. Parents, you gotta monitor what your kids are watching, man. First it's Blippi, and next thing you know, it's cursed tapes. And I don't even know which one is worse. Fuck Blippi. Yoichi reveals that he brought the tape here from home. After some paranormal prompting from his cousin. With their son's life on a time limit now, Reiko and Ryuji take a boat to Oshima Island. Earlier, Ryuji learned the tape's mirror madame is Shizuko Yamamura, a local psychic who became famous after predicting a volcanic eruption. According to Ryuji, Shizuko was experimented on by Dr. Ikuma, a scientist studying the existence of ESP. Ikuma was ultimately fired in disgrace, while Shizuko threw herself into the island's volcano? What? We don't see it, but since we've seen Shizuko in video form, I guess I'll go ahead and count it as a kill. Sure. 
The exes travel to an inn managed by Shizuko's living relatives, where they find the mirror from the tape. Oh my god, I've never met a famous mirror before. Shizuko's cousin Takashi refuses to answer their questions, but his daughter-in-law is more forthcoming with photo evidence. With Reiko running out of time, Ryuji confronts Takashi on the beach, having surmised his role in his cousin's exploitation. <laughs> When Ryuji grabs the old man, he's sent into a psychic flashback, which pulls in Ryuko and the audience to watch along. They're blasted back to a black and white demonstration of Shizuko's psychic powers. Take two. One rowdy journalist accuses her of fraud, but suddenly drops dead with a face just like Tomoko's and her friends. Shizuko isn't to blame though. It was her haircut hating daughter Sadako, whose powers surpassed even those of her mother. <laughs> <laughs> the pair realized Dr. Akuma must have taken Sadako away after her mother's death. Reiko remembers the phone only rang at the slumber party cabin in Izu, and deduces it's the origin point of the curse. They arrive back in Izu on Reiko's seventh and final day, and waits no time driving back to the cabin. Underneath the building, the pair discovers the well seen at the end of the tape. Touching it pulls Reiko into another monochromatic memory, this time of Akuma killing Sadako via head bashing before throwing her body down the well. In a noteworthy scene, Ryuji descends into the depths. On his way, he finds what he, Buffalo Bill, leaves to be Sadako's fingernails. He and Ryuko work together to bail water out of the well, but looks like she's been skipping arm day and can't keep up with the pace. With one hour left until Stephen Page starts a call-in, Reiko puts on her well-bottomed jeans so she can see things from Sadako's point of view. With a haunted helping hand, Reiko panhandles Sadako's corpse, which cracks open into a bastard skelly. Um, what, was that a good thing? I guess so, since Reiko's seven-day deadline passes without consequence, leading her to believe the curse has been lifted. Seemingly at peace, Reiko and Ryuji return to their respective homes. However, while grading papers, Ryuji's TV suddenly starts playing reruns of the Wishing Well Network. Turns out the curse hasn't been lifted for him, and Ryuji is treated to an extended cut of the tape. In it, Sadako crawls out of the well and starts creeping towards the camera. To achieve Sadako's unnatural walk, Kabuki actress Rai Ino was filmed walking backwards in a jerky motion. The footage was then played in reverse for the final film. Director Nakata took a lot of inspiration from Kabuki theater, particularly the play Yatsuya Kaiden, widely considered one of Japan's most famous ghost stories. Ryuji attempts to warn Reiko, but is stunned into silence when Sadako busts through the fourth wall and into his living room. Damn, and she need a manicure. Unlike with her eventual American counterpart, Sadako's face is never shown. That hair don't part. Most we see is a single eye. Wide and evil. But that's still enough to kill Ryuji in photo negative form. The whole ordeal is overheard by Reiko, who rushes to Ryuji's building only to find that his body's already been taken away. While poking around his apartment, Reiko's given a clue by Ryuji's towel-faced ghost. Oh, he's Tao Man back. What's up, Tao Man? Uh, what? Do you, do you need a dollar? Oh, no, he was indicating towards the copied videotape. <laughs> Reiko realizes this curse works by chain email rules. The only way to spare yourself is to pass a copy of the tape onto someone else. Desperate to save Yoichi, Reiko decides to sacrifice her father's life in exchange for her son's. <laughs> Reiko speeds off to spread the good word of Sadako, and the movie ends with a fade to black and white. How many kills did Sadako get to help ring in the new year? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Except, wait a minute, in Japan they drive on the other side of the road, so should I go that way for the numbers? Huh. If only someone could help me figure out- Whoa! Oh! Hey towel man, what's up? Uh, oh! It's that way? You sure? Alright, thank you. Helpful guy. Wonder who he is. I counted seven kills in Ring, one for each day of the week. There were four female victims and three male victims, giving us this ring-shaped pie chart, which is actually a first for the show. We've had 19 other kill counts with seven kills before, but none with this gender breakdown until now. With a runtime of 95 minutes, Ring had a kill on average every 13.57 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Ryuji. It's a shocking way to end the movie, and the image of Sadako climbing out of the TV is one of the most iconic in horror history. Double Shetty for lamest kill will go to Tadahiko and Yoko, who died in car and off screen. And that's it! Ring was released in 1998 and set off the early 2000s gold rush for foreign language horror remakes. That's it for us here on The Kill Count in 2023, but I'll see you bright and shining in the new year next Friday with Orphan First Kill. 
Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count for Ring. Unlike the past three years, we are not going to be taking any breaks in January for the Kill Count. We're just gonna keep on going with weekly episodes for you. In fact, my goal is to have a Kill Count every single week in 2024. That's right, at least 52 Kill Counts. That's not including when we double up. So keep an eye out because we're also gonna be trying to cover the most requested movies. And if you wanna request a film, make sure you email it to deadmeatmovies at gmail.com. We've also got some really exciting other stuff coming for you in the new year. We're gonna have the second Horror Royal Rumble in January. They Talk Season 2 in February, the third annual Dead Meat Horror Awards in March, and right after that, the premiere of a brand new series, Production Tales from Hell, written and hosted by our friend Chauncey K. Robinson. I'm super thrilled for it, and I hope that you are too. So have a happy new year, and be good people.